Introduction to Congruences. Pause the video for a moment and read the definition. Okay, so we have A congruent to B, mod M, that's how it's read. If M divides evenly into A minus B, that's what that notation means. For example, 27 is congruent to 2, mod 5, because if we look at the difference between 27 and 2, it's 25, and 5 divides evenly into that. 81 is congruent to 1, mod 10, because if we look at 81 minus 1, 10 divides evenly into that. Another way to look at it is two numbers are congruent for a given mod if the remainder, when we divide by the mod, is the same. For example, back to my example of 27 and 2, if I divide 27 by 5, the remainder is 2. And 81 divided by 10, the remainder is 1. Similarly, we could say 27 is congruent to 122 mod 5 either because the difference between the two numbers is divisible by 5, or the remainder, when I divide both of those numbers by 5, is 2, or either of those numbers. So again, pause the video and take a look at this theorem. So we've got A congruent to B, mod M, tells us that A can be shown to be equal to B plus some multiple of M. So looking back at our examples, we said 27 was congruent to 2 mod 5. That tells me by this theorem I could write 27 as 2 plus some multiple of 5, and in fact it would be 5 times 5. We said 81 was congruent to 1 mod 10. And again, we can write 81 then as 1 plus some multiple of 10, and that multiple is 8 this time. So just a different way to look at congruences. Now this is a bit longer theorem, so again, pause the video please and take a look at it. So these properties are similar to those properties you use when you solve equations. The reflexive property says that A is congruent to itself, mod M. The symmetric property says that if A is congruent to B, then B is congruent to A. So you can swap sides of a congruence. And the transitive property tells us that if A is congruent to B and B is congruent to C, you guessed it, A is congruent to C. Notice this is mod M for all of these cases. It is not true if the mods are not the same. The set of integers are divided into sets called congruences class, congruence classes modulo M. So what does that mean? Let's take a look at modulo 5. So think about it for a minute. What are all the remainders you can get when you divide by 5? That would be 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are all the remainders. Every integer is congruent to exactly one of these. Any multiple of 5 is congruent to the 0, right? And this is modulo 5. So we've got 5, 10, 15. We could go on forever. And similarly in the negative direction, we'd have negative 5, dot, 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 etc. All of those things with remainder 1 would be 6, and 11, and 16, and on the other side we'd be subtracting 5, we get negative 4, etc. And similarly we could do that with 2, and 3, and 4. The congruence classes modulo 5, there would be exactly four of them. And they would be the set of all of these integers. So for example, the first congruence class would be all of these integers that are congruent to 0. The second one would be all of those values that are congruent to 1, etc. Again, pause the video and take a look at this definition. So we're talking about a complete system of residues mod M is a set of integers such that every integer is congruent modulo M to exactly one integer in that set. That's a real fancy way to say basically the set of all possible remainders. So again, if we look at modulo 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are the set of all possible remainders, and we just said every integer is congruent to exactly one of those. 
So that's a complete system of residues modulo m. If I ask you for that, again, it's a fancy way to ask you what are all the remainders that you can get when you divide by that mod. So modulo 7, you would say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, quite often we put these values in this form, but just as easily I could put any other number in that set. So for 0, I could put any number of, any multiple of 7. I could have 7. For 1, I could have 1, or 1 plus or minus any multiple of 7. So for example, 8. You know, I could add 14 to 2, and it doesn't change its value mod 7. So I could have a 16 here. And similarly, I could add multiples of 7 to each one of these. We'll see some examples like that later. Again, pause the video and take a look at this theorem. This theorem is going to help us solve linear congruences. It basically tells us the legal moves we can do. So we've got A and B congruent, and C and T D congruent, again, both mod M. And the first part tells you then that A plus C and B plus D would be congruent mod M. So if you have two things that are congruent for the same mod, you can add the same value or a congruent value to both sides. Similarly, you could subtract the same value or a value congruent to both sides, and the congruence would hold. Or you can multiply both sides by the same value or two values that are congruent. Notice the part 4 that we use for linear equations is not here. We can't divide both sides of the congruence by the same value. So we'll talk about how to handle that problem momentarily. So a linear congruence is a congruence of the form ax plus b mod m, where x is our unknown integer variable. And this is a, an example of a congruence in one variable, because there's only one variable there, x. So now, how do we solve this linear congruence, 2x congruent to 3 mod 7? If it was an equation, 2x equals 3, then you would tell me, I hope, divide both sides by 2, and x equals 3 halves. That is absolutely true, but not at all relevant for this particular problem. Why is that? Because we can't divide both sides of the congruence by the same value. That wasn't part of the theorem. But our goal is to get rid of this 2. We want it to be 1x, and we've got 2x. Okay, so I'd like it to be a 1, so I want to think of all of the things that are congruent to 1 mod 7. Think about those congruence classes. Add or subtract any multiple of 7, and you're going to get something congruent to 1. So if I do 1 is congruent to 8, for example, that's true mod 7. So if I could somehow change this 2 into an 8x, then 8x would be congruent to 1x, and we would be on our way. And I hope you can think of a good way to turn it into 8, since 8 is 4 times 2. So I'm going to multiply both sides of the congruence by 4. So I've got 8x congruent to 12 mod 7. I multiplied by 4 on both sides. Okay, so now mod 7, I want to reduce 8. What's the remainder when I divide 8 by 7? 7 goes in one time, but the remainder is 1. So that 8x just becomes x. And 12, what is the remainder when I divide 7 by 12? And the remainder is 5. And that is, in fact, the solution. You can check your work if you want. Plug that value of x into the original equation. Is 2 times 5 congruent to 3 mod 7? 2 times 5 is 10. And that is congruent to 3 mod 7, since the remainder uh, dividing 10 by 7 is 3. So feel free to pause the video if you want to, and see if you can give this one a try. Again, our goal is to get rid of that 5 in front of the x. We'd like a 1 there. So now mod 9, we're thinking of all the things that are congruent to 1. 1 is congruent to 10, and we're going to keep adding 9 until we get to a multiple of 5. I've made these examples pretty straightforward so that we get there quickly, but sometimes you have to add the mod several times. 
but 10 is 2 times 5. So if I multiply both sides of the congruence by 2, I'm going to get 10x is congruent to 12 mod 9. And then next we reduce. 10 becomes 1x. Since the remainder when you divide 10 by 9 is 1, and 9 becomes 3, because if you divide 12 by 9, the remainder is 3. Okay, And again, we can check our answer if we want. 5 times 3 is congruent to 6 mod 9. Is that true? 15 congruent to 6? It surely is, because the remainder when you divide 15 by 9 is 6. So we know you got the right solution. Now this one is going to turn out to be a little bit longer, but the same theory applies. We want to get rid of that 12. We'd like it to be a 1, so we're going to find the things congruent to 1 mod 19. And we keep adding 19 to 1 until we get to a multiple of 12. So 1 is congruent to 20, 39, and eventually we get to 96, which is 12 times 8. So we need to multiply both sides of this congruence by 8. And we get 96x is congruent to 136 mod 19. Okay, we're almost there. We're going to reduce each one of these values mod 19. The 96 by design reduces to 1 mod 19. You can check that. The remainder when you divide 96 by 19 is 1. So we get x. And then 136 is congruent to 3 mod 19, because again, when you divide by 19, the remainder is 3. We'll check our answer. 12 times 3 is 36. Is that congruent to 17 mod 19? Sure, if you take 36 and subtract 19, you're going to get 17, correct? So that is the solution. In the next two videos, we'll talk about finding modular inverses and solving these problems that have multiple solutions. I hope that helps and have a great day.